today is just going to be a real basic introduction to solar photovoltaic for the amateur radio addict or enthusiast, really giving us some basic viewpoints on what would it take to put a PV system in place for supplemental power usage. And, and we can talk off grid, you know, Kara uh, has several installations on mountaintops. I'm thinking of Pigeon Mountain in particular, that is completely solar powered, which is wonderful. However, you know, when people say, what can I actually produce with a solar system? The answer always is, well, it depends. And so it depends on a lot of factors. I'm just gonna go over a few of those tonight, but please, if there's any questions you have along the way, don't hesitate to uh, ask me. So uh, and what I'll do, um, Pat, is I'll share this uh, PowerPoint with you because a lot of the links here will click you over to YouTube videos and other bits of information that are extremely useful. This TED Ed talk that I've got highlighted at the top here, on how these PV modules work. The fellow goes through a great explanation, very simplistic, doesn't get deep into the weeds on how the PN junction works and, and that sort of thing, but really helps to explain how PV modules produce electricity. And for the rest of us, really, if you think about it, and again, simplified analysis, voltage is like the pressure, the pressure of pushing electrons. Electricity is simply the flow of electrons through a circuit. So with the photovoltaic module, which is a PN junction, but it's got obviously a clear tempered glass side to it and typically mounted on an aluminum substrate. When that photonic energy from the sun hits that PV module, it knocks those electrons free and it puts some pressure in there to enable them or to encourage them to flow out the negative terminal to the load and back on the positive terminal, as you see in this little picture right here. Each of the small cells can produce approximately 0.5 to 0.6 volts. So simply put, we're gonna put a bunch of these cells into a panel, and that's what's gonna enable us to produce the, typically on the ones I have at the house here, the 80 watt panels I have, they're typically putting out about 18 volts on a nice sunny day. Uh, today's modules that you purchase, typically you're gonna purchase a three to 400 watt module, and they can be putting out anywhere from 36, 48 or 72 volts. So much higher voltage. And we'll talk about how we take that higher voltage and transform it so we can charge our 12 volt battery with it because typically we're gonna operate a 12 volt system. So again, you go outside on a bright sunny day, you feel that sun warming your skin. Well, those are photons from the sun hitting your skin. Well, those photons are hitting this PN junction, this piece of electronics, and it's knocking the electrons free that'll then flow out, back, reconnect with the positive ions, the, the atoms missing that electron and recombine and off it goes again. Photons hit it, knock it free and around it goes. The nice thing about PV modules obviously is that they're no moving parts. So when you look at it, people are still asking us in class, for example, so what's the lifespan of a PV module? Truth is nobody knows because mine are 20 years old and I may not get a full 80 watts out of them anymore. Sometimes the glass can get uh, discolored, other factors can affect it, but you're not replacing a PV module because it wears out. Oftentimes it's because I only have limited space and I have filled my space with 80 watt modules. And I'm saying, hey, I wanna have a higher output. I'm gonna replace them with 300 or 400 watt modules. So great thing is there's no moving parts. Um, I don't think I have the video, but if anybody's curious about how durable they are, a company down in the States actually fired ice balls about the size of a very large marble at PV modules, didn't break them, shot uh, baseballs like your neighborhood boy you might have in the neighborhood, uh, hit them, didn't have any effect. They even took the modules and put them on a platform and drove a truck on them and parked the truck on top of the PV modules and they didn't break. So from a durability perspective, extremely robust. Having said that, it's still glass and it still is PN junction. It still is electronic material in behind there. So the biggest issue that I've seen with them is somebody dropping them on the corner, just like your cell phone, quite robust, but if you hit it the right way, you're gonna shatter it, right? So what I'm saying is if you have it out on a field day or whatever, you don't have to treat them with kid gloves, but be aware that there's a glass panel on the front, obviously. Um, what kind of solar cell to get? So my 
particular cells are um, polycrystalline, but basically when you look at all these different types, basically what we want to look at is the efficiency of them. When people are looking how much of that photonic energy can we actually uh, convert from photonic energy to electrical energy, you're typically looking around the 10 to 20% mark. So when people are saying, hey, I want to put solar in my house, I want to produce all this, this energy, just be aware that Yes, they're efficient, but the newer ones, you can get upwards of 30 to 40%. But for most of the affordable ones that we're looking at, you're typically looking at yeah, 15 to 20% for most of them. Um, polycrystalline, when people ask me about it, I say, you know, if you go down to Home Depot and you buy plywood, plywood is several thin sheets of wood glued together to give you a very, very strong building material. Oriented strand board, or as we know it, OSB, works well, but it's basically just chunks of uh, wood pieces that are glued together, glue being the primary substrate. Polycrystalline panels are the same way. When they build a silicon ingot and slice it, they're getting round pieces out of that ingot. So any of the high efficient monocrystalline panels will actually have circular solar cells to them because that is the most efficient format you can get for PV systems. However, not affordable or as affordable. So a lot of times I'll take the crystalline pieces and compress them together efficiently and produce a panel. If you look at it at an angle, it looks like there's all these little broken pieces of silicone squished together, much like oriented strand board or OSB. Again, at the end of the day, is it gonna produce the voltage and the current that you're looking for? And the answer is probably yes, but it's just, if you're looking for something to, to give you maximum production, and again, uh, when I talk to people who are looking at doing an off-grid installation for their cabin, or if somebody is living in their motorhome or their RV or wanting to rely on PV systems, maybe then it's worthwhile spending extra money. But typically we're looking at about 20% efficiency on a lot of these PV modules. The warranties on them, typically five to 10 years, they tell you that you know your your wattage degradation because they're typically rated in watts may degrade by 10 to 20 percent over that 20 year lifespan mine are like i say 15 or 20 years old and again they charge my batteries and they keep my toys running that i have in my garage so uh, i'm not planning on changing them anytime soon but again lots of links that i put in here for folks to look at if they want to research it further and again don't want to get too deep into the what's happening inside of it, but just want to take a look at two different important factors coming from that solar panel or that photovoltaic panel. And without getting too heavy into these curves, basically what we want to look at is if you take that PV module and you put it out in a bright sunny day under standard test conditions, and that means with so much sunlight intensity and a panel temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, it should produce this much voltage. Open circuit voltage, of course, as we know, if anything's not connected, it'll always have the largest voltage possible. Because once you connect a load and you have current flowing through that load, then you have line losses and other losses inside the circuit. So you actually have a voltage decrease. So your open circuit voltage will always be maximum when no current is flowing. Well, that doesn't do me much good. On the flip side, you can take a PV module can be a 400 watt PV module. You can take the positive and negative lead when it's sitting out on that bright sunny day and you can plug them in together. You can short that PV module out. Everything inside that module is rated for the maximum current that that PV module can deliver. So if you notice on the upper left hand side of this graph here, you see the short circuit currents, ISC. That's literally under standard test conditions. What is the maximum current that'll flow through this module? So both numbers, are information that you need to understand when you're actually designing systems because you want to make sure that the wire is big enough to handle the maximum current and the insulation rating on the wire etc cetera, etc cetera, can handle the maximum open circuit voltage so lots of factors to consider but for our talk today what's really important is right in the upper right hand corner of this graph this maximum power point that's the point at which this pv module this solar panel is going to produce maximum power that's where I want to be is right there where that circle is a little bit less than the maximum short circuit current a little bit less than the open circuit voltage but that'll give me the maximum output 
out of this PV module. Again, field A, I want to take that voltage and current, that power, feed it into my batteries, recharge my batteries, and also supply power to my mobile rigs or whatever the case may be. So that's where we want to be right there. So the efficiency is exactly that. When you, they take a look at the, we're going to get into these terms right here, when they take a look at the photonic impact on that PV module, how much of that solar energy is actually being converted to electricity, to voltage and current that's flowing out of that module. So typically that 15 to 20 percent. Still free power, I mean we did have to buy the PV modules and whatnot, but that's typically where we sit. Now just to jump back there, none of these modules that we see in this picture are the flexible film modules that you see oftentimes on sailboats and other areas where you want to have this module that curves, fits the feature that you have. Those modules are significantly more expensive and significantly less efficient because in order to make a flexible membrane, you can't have that PN junction the way it normally sits. You have to use a silk screening type process to be able to put that that material in place so the sunlight can hit it yet it can still remain flexible so they're very convenient but they're not extremely efficient right so um, great to have if you have an application that needs to have a curving module if you go we'll, we'll take a look at a renergy website one of the companies that has reasonable prices and they're really pushing the flexible pv modules they're great just be aware that they're not as efficient as the other ones right so Robin, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, as far as um, it was technology uh, from the compared to say five, ten years ago, are mm -hmm. they still using the basic silicon uh, junction, or are there new materials, or um, what are they what are they using today? Is it any better than the it was? Yeah, the materials are more efficient. So the PN junctions, the way they're building the junctions are getting better. So they are increasing the efficiency, which is helping, but that's good. But what I wanna get back to is some of the factors affecting it because you can have a 30% efficient PV module, but if you're not hitting it with enough sunlight intensity, if you're not getting enough hours of sunlight throughout the day, these factors right here, you can have a, a more efficient PV module, but it may not be benefiting you, right? So uh, here in Alberta, we're actually very fortunate because um, Government of Canada on the Canadian website actually shows us calculations where they've done averaging factors for us to take a look at how many hours of sunlight do we actually have where we're going to have enough sunlight over 1000 watts per meter squared to be able to generate the voltage we want in our PV modules. Uh, for me in Ericana, my average throughout the year is 4.72 hours per day. Well, <laughs> yeah, right now, it's about two hours, right, to be able to hit that peak or reach it. In July or June 21st, it's probably 10 hours. But we use those calculations when we're doing cost estimates for customers to say, the customer's saying, hey, how much money am I going to make with this PV system I'm installing on my house? After you say, it depends, <laughs> then you let them know, based on the averages, this is what we're looking at. So they are becoming more efficient on the high-end modules, uh, Jerry, but understanding that, you know, Tesla's solar shingles and some of this other technology that looks really cool has a much lower efficiency. And the reason shingles, I think, are an awesome idea, but where they lose the efficiency is you have that shingle sitting against the roof membrane, OSB, whatever it happens to be. When the sunlight hits the PV module, it warms up. There's nowhere to cool that, or there's very, very little area underneath there for cooling. Well, if we look deeply into a PV module, and I don't have a lot of the graphs here, but we could look them up. A PV module actually produces more voltage as it gets colder. So that module that's rated at 18 volts at 25 degrees Celsius, which is the standard test conditions, can actually hit 25 to 28 volts in our minus 30 temperatures. So cold is good. Colder is better. But if that module is sitting on the roof, like a shingle, for example, the sunlight hits it, it warms up, and there's not a lot of area to cool it. So 
again, <laughs> there's lots of different factors affecting the, the amount of voltage and current, the amount of power you're going to be getting out of these. So again, the intensity of the sunlight. And as you notice, we've got a cloudy day. My PV modules are still producing voltage and current, just not as much as they will on a clear sunny day. Next week's down to minus 28 again. Good news. <laughs> Good news for my PV system, not for me, but for my PV system, because my voltage will increase and I'll have more power available to charge my batteries. However, my batteries are also outdoors in the cold and the chemical process slows down when it gets cold. So again, lots of different factors if you're looking at how can I design a system that's going to be adequate for my mobile operation. The, I guess the fun of all of this is we get to play with it. There's no buy this module with this battery and you're guaranteed that it's going to last you. It's more about, hey, let me play with this system and see what it can actually do for me when I go camping. Got my PV modules out there with my charge controller to charge my batteries throughout the day. Perfect. But I don't have the mountain on my trailer yet. So I'm always chasing the sunlight because in Kananaskis, the sun is coming through the trees and then it's coming over here. So I'm constantly moving my modules to be able to catch the sunlight as it goes across the sky, right? So lots of, lots of different factors we need to take into account when we're designing systems like this. And you can get highly complex. Some of the links I have at the end, Jerry, we can take a look at it and uh, for the engineering folk in the in the um, in the crowd there's some awesome resources that get really deep into the actual manufacture of the pv module itself and some of the new technology they're coming out with bifacial modules they don't have an aluminum back to them they have glass on both sides so not only do they catch the sunlight hitting the module from directly from the sun, they also catch the reflected sunlight that can reflect off the ground and hit the back of the module. So they're seeing an increase of 20 to 40% output from that module, but at a reflected cost as well, right? So if real estate is a premium, that might be a solution you're looking for. I'm of the school that if I had an extra hundred dollars, I'm gonna buy just another reasonably priced module and add it to my kit as opposed to buying one of the higher end ones. But for people with limited space, that's certainly an option. Uh, so insulation, again, these are terms used in the PV industry. The number of hours of sunlight that you have per day, we're actually going to produce at least that rated wattage out of the panel, if not greater. The angle that you pointed to, so going back to your, your question, Niru, in, in order for those photons to be absorbed by that PN junction, you want to have the the solar panel perpendicular to the rays of sun. So in our area here, our latitude is 51 so many degrees. If we angle it ideally there for most of the year, the sunlight will hit it perpendicular. Problem is in the summertime, the sun is much higher up overhead. In the wintertime, as you notice, the sun is much lower on the horizon. And so that's why there's tracking systems that people build so that that solar PV module tracks from west to east throughout the day from morning till afternoon and it can track up and down depending upon the time of the year always trying to maintain that panel perpendicular to the sun's rays so thinking about you jerry and our discussions about esp 8266s and raspberry pis there's technology you can build to be able to build a system that'll actually detect the amount of sunlight and the angle that it sits at and actually design a tracking system through servos and whatnot if you wanted to, to be able to have your system tracking. At the end of the day, having a PV module set up with a charge control and a battery is still going to produce electricity, possibly enough for what you, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Where the plants will follow the sunlight near you, the same thing with a PV module very costly to buy commercial tracking systems, but I'm going to be looking at uh, taking a look at seeing if I can't build one of my own with a Raspberry Pi computer just to see how much more energy I can generate from that PV module with those systems as opposed to the um, uh, standalone stationary systems. So the angle of the sunlight, like I was saying, wintertime much lower on the horizon, summertime much higher. <laughs> I've got a couple pictures of my installation. I use the KISS method. I just keep it simple. That's keep it simple, Sparky, for the electrical folk in the group, right? 
I just want to keep it simple so I don't have to mess with changing the angles on a regular basis, but I sacrifice some of the efficiency for it. Atmospheric, and they call it uh, AM, atmospheric measure. How much of the atmosphere is the sunlight going through? So on Pigeon Mountain, that mountain's quite high. So there's less atmosphere for the photons to travel through. Obviously, there's more, for, more photonic energy up higher. And of course, in Calgary, we're up fairly high. We have a great advantage compared to uh, Vancouver, for example. That's at sea level. They also have a lot more cloud cover and whatnot. So if you looked at the uh, Canadian Natural Resources website, they'll show you the, the number of hours of sunlight in Southern Alberta averaging 4 to 4.8 typically. I think Abbotsford is 3.2 or whatever hours per day. Again, this is averaged over the course of a year, but goes to show you how many more hours of sunlight we have here that we can take advantage of in addition to our cooler temperatures, right? Um, temperature, like I say, the colder the better. So again, when you have that cold temperature, you'll see an increase in voltage. We average in Southern Alberta about 1200 watts per meter squared of sunlight instead of a thousand. So that additional photonic energy increases the current output out of the PV module. So typically in Southern Alberta, we'll get more voltage than what's rated under normal circumstances, more current, which is good news for us, right? Not excessively so, but factors of 20% are not unreasonable, right? Depending upon the conditions. Obviously, shading creates a concern, and I'll show you some pictures that I've done with my Raspberry Pis and my voltage monitors. I've got four different battery sets that I run in the garage, two 24-volt systems and two 12-volt systems, and I have monitoring on them. So I'll sort of show you some of the graphs of the PV energy that I generate throughout the day going back into my batteries. Now, having said that, we're almost seven days away from the shortest day of the year. So on my systems that are important, I have 120 volt battery chargers that the Raspberry Pi can turn on so that if there's not enough sunlight recharging my system, the Raspberry Pi detects that, turns on the 120 volt battery charger, and I use the battery charger from midnight till four o'clock in the morning just to help boost those batteries up so they can last. The battery charger is never turned on from probably February to November. Typically there's enough sunlight for me to be able to recharge the batteries considering how much I use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's cool. I'm just reading their chats again. The city of Calgary one is very cool if you're ever looking at putting PV modules on your house because that map of the city of Calgary will actually show you, especially if you've got a south facing um, roof ideally where you can place those PV modules to maximize the harvest. Does it have to be south facing? No, you can have them in another direction. It just means that your harvest won't be as optimal, right? South facing at 51 degrees, if I wasn't adjusting it, would be the ideal angle for, for a Calgary roof, for example, right? Yeah, that one's very cool. All right, so again, this is just sort of showing you the summer sun path versus the winter sun path. Good to know information, but at the end of the day, have you got them set up? And like I say, I'll show you some pictures that I have in the backyard of my house. I've got my panels for some of them <laughs> mounted on my deck vertically. They still work fine, but they're not producing the maximum power that they could produce because I don't have them at the optimum angle. But it's sometimes your real estate dictates something more important than what you'd actually like to set up. So this is the atmospheric measure that I was talking about. If the sun was directly overhead, it's just going through one atmosphere. If the sun is rising or setting, then obviously you have more air to pass through, more attenuation on the photonic energy, less output from the devices. So again, if I had a tracker that started off looking to the west and tracked throughout the day, I would be optimizing the photonic energy hitting those PV modules. So there's my backyard. That's my high tech setup right there for some of my PV modules. These are 80 watt PV modules I have set up on here. Uh, and like I say, I'm thinking at least 20 years old and they're still producing well. That tree branch obviously has no leaves in the middle of winter here. Uh, when the leaves are in play, 
that shading does decrease the quality of sunlight or the amount of sunlight hitting those PV modules, but still enough for me to be able to produce the energy I need to produce to keep my batteries topped up. So ideally, yeah, perpendicular to the sun, but if you're off angle, you'll still have some reflected energy that's not going to be useful for you, but you still have a lot of that directed energy as well. So what about the snow? A lot of folks say, oh yeah, but I don't want to have to go clean my PV modules off all the time when it snows. Nate did an incredible test a number of years ago for I believe five years. They installed these identical modules as you see in the left-hand picture on the roof of one of their buildings. And some poor soul, his job was every morning to go out and clear the snow off of one set of PV modules. And they go from vertical to near horizontal trying to mimic typical roof pitches as well as 52 degrees which is what Edmonton is at to try to see how much this snow load would affect the harvest of the photonic energy and what they found was surprisingly so only about a maximum of five percent of the photonic energy is lost between the cleared panel and the snow covered panel as you can see in the background the vertical panel obviously no snow is setting on that one but it's not at the optimum angle. The rest of them, this snow loading really doesn't affect the harvest of that PV module as much as we might expect. So uh, Pigeon Mountain, do we worry about going up there and clearing the snow off there? No, because like I say, typically maximum we would expect to lose is typically about 5%. The more critical issue is obviously shading as that sun is setting lower are there groups of trees or there are other obstructions that are going to be restricting the amount of sunlight that is hitting that PV module. On the right hand side here is the last experiment I put up in my backyard. Two PV modules feeding a charge controller to a small 12 amp hour gel cell to my Raspberry Pi Pico that I'm just recording the temperature and the voltage on that uh, PV module and what it's producing. I'm trying to get a sense for myself uh, I'm a great gardener. I love gardening, container gardening, but I'm a terrible waterer. I always forget. So my goal is next year is to have a PV system with water pumps, taking my rain barrel water to be able to pump and water my plants automatically because I know I'm not going to remember. So my experiments right now are saying, hey, in the shortest of days that we have in the winter, am I going to have enough produced energy? So as you see the snow across the bottom of those PV modules, yeah, it's awesome, right? The solar systems work really, really well. And again, we're gardening in the summertime where we have those longer days. We have a much better uh, harvest of energy in the summer than we do in the winter, right? However, in the winter, when those panels are at minus 30 or minus 40, you can see a significant increase in current. And with the sunlight that's hitting it, an increase in the voltage as well. So when people are asking, so how complicated is I've got eight 250 liter uh, drums, barrels outside. And uh, in Ericana, we pay an, an, an outrageous amount for our water. And so that was my goal as well, is to have all those containers filled up when it rains, right? And then be able to filter that and then put it through a pump through a solar system to be able to then water my container garden because I know I will. So how do we connect it? Super, super simple. Again, we don't have enough time to really get into the series versus parallel discussion. We can talk about it briefly, but really what do you see? You see the PV system, in this case, two identical panels. Important if you're gonna parallel anything to ensure that they're identical panels. Tie them together, going into a charge controller. So the job of the charge controller is to take the fluctuating voltage and varying current, but take that fluctuating voltage and ensure that it's set to typically 14.4 volts for a 12 volt battery. Biggest concern we have is overcharging of batteries, chemical reaction. In the old school car batteries, if you ever had an old school charger back in the day, I used to go in there and I could hear the electrolysis. I could hear the bubbling of the hydrogen and oxygen gases coming off that battery with the old charges we used to have back in the day because it was overcharging that battery beyond its, its ampacity. Batteries are typically the most expensive part of your PV system. A solar panel these days, a 300 watt solar panel, it's 
probably about a dollar a watt. That's three hundred dollars. Charge controller, and again, we'll look at some here in a minute. One hundred and thirty dollars. Batteries for decent deep cycle batteries. <sighs> for a decent system, you're probably looking at to start a couple three hundred dollars. If you were to do your your cabin, if you had an off-grid cabin, for example, typically you'd be looking at anywhere from six to fifteen thousand dollars for a proper set of batteries that could last you several days, right? Given the changing climate and whatnot, if you were dependent upon that power, the energy storage system that you have is probably the most expensive portion of this system. For a hobbyist, Dana has a battery he brings with him on field day. I do the same thing. You can pick up a car battery, a flooded cell, and it'll still do the job. It just won't do it as well as a proper deep cycle battery that you can purchase to be able to continuously deliver that 20 amps you need for your transmitter or whatever the case may be. So basic, simple system though, you're taking the solar PV modules, you're tying them to the charge controller. From the charge controller, you're going to the batteries. These days, we all want to know how is my system doing and so many of them now have a Bluetooth module that you can hook up and download the app to your phone and you can actually see the voltage and the current, the watts being delivered from the charge controller to the batteries. And of course, in the bottom right hand corner, an inverter that then takes the 12 volts DC from the batteries and reconverts it to your 120 volts AC to drive any AC loads that you have. But very, very simple installation. Just remember that the charge controller plays a super important role to take the varying voltage and current coming from the PV modules and ensures that it's applying a proper voltage to the battery so you don't overcharge them. Like I say, on the old flooded batteries, you could hear that bubbling. You used to have to refill them with distilled water back in the day, still do on flooded systems. The problem with a gel cell, your gel cells, your AGM batteries, is they have vents but they don't have a way to replenish that liquid. So if they're overcharged and they vent, there's no way to replenish that liquid. So it's really shortening the life of a battery if you overcharge it. So that's why the charge controller is so important to make sure that you don't overcharge the batteries as you're recharging them uh, when you're not using the current coming from the system. So pretty straightforward. You'll have two terminals and I've got a better picture of a SunSaver controller here. Two terminals for your PV system two terminals for your battery, right? So let's say your batteries are fully charged. The charge controller would sense that. Yep. And what does it do when there's a lot of voltage still coming or a lot of current wanting to come in from the solar panels? Yeah, so it's like a gate, uh, Jerry. It just simply stops allowing the current to flow from the solar panel, from the PV module into the batteries. Just right. like your plug-in in your house, there's 120 volts sitting in that plug-in, but if nothing is plugged in, that voltage is just sitting there waiting to do something, but nobody wants it, right? right. The charge controller is simply a gate. If those batteries are fully charged, it just stops the photovoltaic energy. It stops those electrons from flowing into the battery. So no harm will come. That PV module can sit there in the bright sunlight all day long and not deliver any electrons, not deliver any current flow to a load, no problem. Um, however, it's nice to be able to obviously harvest that energy. So sometimes uh, if you have a battery and your mobile rig, for example, that charge controller is still making sure the voltage doesn't hurt the battery, but a lot of that current could feed into your rig and some of that current could feed into the battery. So you're charging the batteries as well as powering up whatever load you have. But no, it's not gonna hurt anything to have a fully charged battery with the charge controller in place to ensure that you don't overcharge those systems. So yeah, not gonna hurt anything at all. Great question. And wind Windmills can do something different. You'll, you'll see some charge controllers that when, when, they're, um, when, when they're not loaded down, you can switch them to a, a dummy load. Um, and that's because windmills are a bit different. If you don't load them up in high winds, um, they, they can take tear themselves apart. Yeah. Problem with a windmill is it's a DC motor. And the only way you're going to slow a DC motor down is to have a, without getting too deep, without counter EMF, that motor spins, spins freely. So you have to have that 
load on there. You have to have a load on there to be able to slow the blades down or else you're gonna have some troubles with that thing that you say, Dana, spinning out of control. So yeah, you have that load resistor in a charge controller for a wind system should always have that load resistor in place. So even if you don't need the energy that's being produced by the wind, you still have a load on that DC motor to create the counter EMF that you need to slow the rotor down, right? Or else some mechanical braking system or feathering of the blades or something for sure. Question, do sure. charge controllers come with different capacities? Like I, your diagram shows two solar panels. Supposedly you could hook 10 solar panels together. Would you use the same charge controller? Uh, you could. So let me just jump over here. Hold that thought for a second and we'll get back to that, that question. That's a great question. Because we'll talk about parallel versus series concerns and why if you have a choice, you do not want to hook things in parallel. And we'll talk about why here in a second. So this is just on a sun saver. It's a pulse width modulated charge controller. Good. There's better, but these are good, right? You see the two terminals for your solar panel on the left-hand side, the two terminals for the battery in the center, and this one has two terminals for the load. So these sun savers, like a lot of these small controllers, are designed for systems that you want to turn on when it's dusk and turn off when it's daylight. Think uh, pathway lighting, those sorts of systems. So this system right here will charge the battery in the daytime. And then when the solar energy drops to a preset level that's predetermined in these devices, it'll switch on the load and allow you to light your pathway all night long, for example, right? Uh, you can also use them as safety devices. You can hook a load to them in the other configuration and have the load being fed off of here. The advantage there is like with my Raspberry Pis, if I don't keep my battery charged up, I don't want to damage my battery by discharging it too far. These devices will have a low voltage cutout, typically at 11 and a half volts. It'll shut off these load terminals to shut off your load so you can't damage your batteries by discharging them too far. Just looking at some of the um, <laughs> some of the comments what we're talking about, some of the other technologies, any lithium technology, absolutely. Fantastic batteries. However, you have to ensure that the battery system you purchase and the charging system you purchase are matched for each other. And that applies to any system, but in particular, because of the dangers with the lithium family of batteries, you have to ensure that the charge controller is set properly. Because typically there's four different um, charge processes it goes through. There's a rapid bulk charge, then there's an equalization charge potentially, and then it tapers down eventually to a trickle charge. So the rate at which it charges is gonna be dependent upon the type of battery you have. So absolutely, if you're getting, and that's where you wanna deal with a manufacturer for the both. If you're getting a good quality lithium, whatever type ion, phosphate, whatever the case may be battery, ensure that your charge controller is designed for that technology of batteries to ensure that it's going to take care of those batteries and not cause any danger obviously but also to maximize the life of those batteries because that will be a significant investment you make in your pv system so what this one right here oh go ahead i was going to ask uh, what type of batteries would work well in our winters like in sub-zero like uh... <laughs> none, <laughs> none? Uh, okay. the challenge i mean again my 12 amp hour gel cell that I have outside right now will still work down to minus 30. The problem is it's a chemical process that's taking place inside that battery to be able to generate those electrons. So where you might have 12 amp hours at 25 degrees Celsius, it might drop down to six amp hours at minus 30. And on a, on yeah. a proper system, I got a flood it in the garage, you know, it's warmer than outside, but it's still not, not I'm not happy with it. You know, I, I even got a, like a, a warm up blanket for it, like an electrical blanket to keep it up. <laughs> yeah, we, when we had some, we had a solar garage at Sate and we just took a, a metal box and we lined it with um, foam, um, um, the hard foam, not the soft foam, and then had the batteries inside there. So again, they do generate heat when they go through the charging cycle. So that will help to maintain that. A, a good quality um, uh, charge controller, this one right here, you can see in the center, there's a temperature sensor 
light on it. So it has the ability to hook up a temperature sensor so that if the charge controller knows that those batteries are cold, then it knows that it cannot deliver the same amount of charge as it can if the batteries are ideally at 25 degrees Celsius. So it'll slow down the charge so that it doesn't try to overcharge the batteries when they get really cold. So yes, try to keep them as warm as possible. I've got a heated garage, so that makes it easy. But anytime you have batteries, make sure they're off the concrete, put them on a two by four a piece of plywood or whatever, and try to, to um, put, if you have, like I say, some hard foam or something, insulation around them to keep them as warm as possible. Again, it's chemical reaction, and when it gets cold, it slows down, right? 14.4, 14.6 typically, and that's very common for many batteries. And again, I'll show you here in a minute once we get through the slide presentation, I'll show you some of my node red graphing that I've done on my battery systems, and you'll see that where it maxes out. So <laughs> PWM, I saw the comment there, right? Yes, don't forget any electronics today, you know, when we were just talking RFI from the vehicles and I was smiling, the problem with electronics today is we use switching circuits, things that turn on and off very quickly, which just happen to generate a ton of EMI and RFI, right? Electromagnetic interference and radio frequency interference. So it's a problem. It is what it is with these devices, right? Unless you have a linear device, think old school transformers and, and individual components. Anytime you have a high speed FET of any sort in there switching on and off, you're generating that electrical noise for sure. But what I want to point out is the difference between pulse width modulation charge controllers versus that maximum power point, that MPP that you saw in that graph, a maximum power point tracking charge controller. Top one, I think Renogy's price is about $50. Bottom one, their price is about $130. So it's not extreme difference but look at the difference in production when you were talking jerry what happens when that battery charges up well take a look and i've just thrown some numbers in here on the graph just to be able to keep the math simple if my pv module bright sunny day lots of sunlight hitting it was capable of producing 36 volts at 10 amps it's going to be a total of 360 watts e times i that's going into the charge controller Charge controller knows that there's a 12 volt battery on there because oftentimes they're auto sensing. It's gonna say, hey, gonna be at 14 or 14.4 volts at 10 amps. Look what happened though. It doesn't increase the current. The, the PWM charge controllers can't because they're simply just turning on and off very quickly, creating that noise, but it's gonna turn on and off very quickly. And it's simply going to reduce the voltage down to a safe level for the battery, but it's 10 amps in, 10 amps out. They're good systems, they work well. But I lose mm, two thirds almost of my power from my PV module to my battery. Take a look at the MPPT charge controllers and they typically operate advertised around 95% efficiency, but look what they do. They take the same voltage and current, they take 360 watts in, you always have some losses with a piece of technology, but they'll put out 14 volts at 25 amps. And so they'll increase the current, they'll bring the voltage down to a safe level, but they'll increase the current to deliver far more current to my battery and my load. So when you're looking at purchasing a charge controller, if you are, take a look and see what type of charge controller it is, buy it from a reputable manufacturer. I bought some cheap $30 supposedly MPPT charge controllers and very quickly found out that they weren't MPPT, they were PWM, misadvertised. But the MPPT controller will try to maximize the wattage coming from the solar panel, the PV module, and feed that into your battery and your load, right, your radio. So, yeah, yeah, it's it. they're both good systems. Uh, out in the country here, there's lots of intersections that have that flashing red light above the stop sign. There's a small PV module. PWM charge controller and a gel cell inside that little box sitting there. That's enough to be able to charge the battery and keep that big red LED light blinking 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They work great. But if you're wanting to maximize it for a field day or for some other event or for your trailer and that sort of thing, definitely want to go this system right here. When you guys are um, talking Robin, about them, go ahead. Oh yeah, Robin, it might be useful to go back to that um, PV curve. Uh -huh. And uh, to point out that um, that the MPPT controller, um, you know, because of the load line, 
um, it'll take that controller will use whatever voltage the uh, the solar cell is producing at that time that'll give you the most power. So basically, what it is is a variable voltage inverter. Uh, instead of having a fixed voltage input, it varies the voltage so you can get that uh, wherever that peak is under the conditions. Exactly. And that's the advantage of them is they're going to take a look at that ever changing voltage and current because again, the clouds pass by the sun, so many other factors throughout the course of the day, all these factors are affecting the actual voltage and current. They don't stay steady like this graph shows. Like you said, Peter, they're always fluctuating. And so the right and the other and the other comment I was going to make is that uh, on that RFI video, if you watch it, um, they talk about uh, the top one of the top threes um, is um, is solar panels for RFI, not solar panels, but solar installations for uh, for RFI. Uh, evidently, California in uh, in the uh, new building now requires that uh, every home be installed uh, uh, equipped with solar. Um, solar technology. So that's kind of interesting and discouraging from an RFI point of view, but it's the MPPT or what they call the optimizers that are spread out on the roofs that are uh, really switch mode power supplies. And yeah. from some manufacturers, they're just radiating all over, all over the place. Uh, Robin, go ahead. And they're consumer electronics, Peter, right? So an optimizer is simply a device that does this MPPT charge controlling, but on a rooftop installation, instead of having one charge controller in the basement with all of your PV modules tied together, every single PV module has an optimizer, a small black box that's mounted to the racking on the roof right in behind it. The idea there is if the, the, the sun or a tree is shading this PV module, but not the rest of them, I'm gonna lose the harvest from one module, but once it passes through the optimizer, that loss is only gonna be from that one module, not from an entire string of PV systems. So definitely there's, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I mean, the bane of our existence, LED lights, compact fluorescence, electronic ballasts, uh, power supplies for our computers. <laughs> The list goes on and on. If I could add a comment about those MPPT controllers, you know, and I've been a big fan of those. All of my installations run those. But um, they do this recalculation, typically anywhere from one, two, three, five seconds. So it's constantly updating, right? So literally, um, you know, it's always, always staying on top of the available light and available energy to do the conversion. Yeah. Yeah. So Matt, you know, it's not just a one and done sort of thing, but it's doing this over and over and over again at, at you know, various rates. Yeah, yeah. But you're right. If, if this is an RFI sensitive area, going back to your point, Peter, that in my opinion, when you talked about both RFI is really important, but I think, you know, every... We'll talk electricians here for a second. Electricians don't understand grounding and bonding as well as they should. It's so critical to understand things that are radiating electrical noise. And if we had a much better understanding of grounding and bonding to be able to provide a path to be able to bleed that electrical noise off, that would be wonderful. Problem is, right, we're all concerned with, with you know, maximizing our dollars. A lot of consumer equipment we have is in a plastic case. <laughs> so the electrical energy inside there is not being shielded by that plastic case or whatever the case may be. So to your point, Dan, um, you know, yes, they're great, but um, if it's an electric or um, RFI sensitive area, I think we need to take a look at other alternative measures where we can help to minimize the radiation. It's gonna radiate it, but how can we minimize that radiation? Shielded cables, shielded enclosures, you know, so many other things we can do to help minimize that electrical noise. Problem is- Enclosures, grounded, um, you know, I've had people argue with me that, you know, like you caught yourself, Peter, when you said, you know, people say solar panels generate noise, but they don't. It's, you know, it's the, the charge controller typically. And then of course, inverters, but, uh, you know, you put ferrite chokes, on all the leads in and out of all of these components. And you can make them pretty quiet if you pay attention to where the noise might be coming from. But yeah, if you can buy a charge controller in a metal enclosure versus a plastic one, 
pay the extra money because there's the natural shielding. Yeah. And shielded cables so often, right? When we talk VFDs, variable frequency drives in school, I'm letting folks know, don't just, I mean, yes, you can hook it up with a regular RW90 wire. It'll still work. But that RW90 wire running from the VFD to the motor is simply an antenna radiating all this yeah. electrical noise off of it. So shielded cables as well. There's That tech many, cable but, is good. Yeah, but for, for, for a lot of us, if we want to play with it, again, that PV module, you're not going to want to take the charge controller and put it right beside your radio. So you're going to want to take a look at how can I take my charging system, PV module, charge controller to my battery and keep those physically distant from your power battery to your transmitter to your antenna system, right? So distance is probably our best friend and most economical way of doing it, but absolutely, right? Just be aware of that, that if you're operating and you want to know how much noise your system is generating, then simply unplug the PV system for a moment to be able to discharge the charge controller and see if there's a difference in the noise floor in your radio. That would help you to determine how much of the noise floor, how much noise that I'm hearing is coming from my <laughs> charging system versus other factors that we have around there too. So, yep, for sure. All right. No, I don't want to do that. Ignore. Love these helpful computers. All right. So just got a couple more slides. Uh, like I say on the, whoops, the right hand side, that's my double panel system. I've got those two in this case right here because I've got a cheap, PWM charge controller, I've got them tied in parallel. They're identical panels and tied in parallel. The reason, actually, no, we'll save that for a minute here. We'll do that at the very end, about parallel versus series. Let's get this finished up. We just got a few more. All right, batteries, lithium polymer, lithium ion, lithium iron phosphate. Oh my goodness, but take a look at the difference. So in the bottom here, this deep cycle hybrid gel battery, this 12 volt, 100 amp hour, good size battery. $250. And that's pretty typical. You'll find higher prices if you go to um, Magnasonic in town and a couple other places, but Renergy has some pretty reasonable prices. But take a look at your lithium iron phosphate, 685, right? Oops. You can get into thousands of dollars and this is for a single battery. Imagine if you wanted to have a system for a small cabin and that sort of thing. So you definitely want to have the right charge controller to take care of these batteries because it will be a significant investment you make in this system right here. Typical lifespan on batteries, 10 to 15 years, just off the top of my head. However, again, whole conversation we could have, the deeper you discharge the battery, so you take it from fully charged down to 50%. You can probably do that for 500 to 1,000 cycles, sometimes several thousand, depending upon the quality of the battery. If you take it from 100% charge down to 20%, you discharge it further, you can do that fewer times. So the more you discharge the battery and bring it back, the fewer times that it'll go through that entire cycle. So again, lots of considerations to make, but for most of us, the gel cells that we see in the bottom here, that deep cycle hybrid gel battery there, that's probably gonna be one of the more affordable ones for us. Lithium ion though, I mean, the prices have come way down compared to where they were before. But like I say, just make sure if you do go lithium any, make sure you have a solar charge controller that is rated for that type of battery chemistry so that it's gonna take care of those batteries safely and also extend the life of those batteries as much as possible. So any of them can be in like in sight into the you well, know, enclosed space? Lithium, lithium do not like cold temperatures even more so. Uh, Tesla vehicles, for example, using the lithium technology, they actually have battery heaters in there. So they have heating elements that are inside the battery compartment itself to maintain a consistent temperature. Cooling system in the summertime and a heating system in the wintertime. So no, lithium are fussier about temperature. So you'd want to take a look at the specs of the battery and see what the range, the uh, But are, are they sealed, you know, like if they would be overcharged uh, in producing um, hydrogen and all that other so gases yes, there? Yes, they're sealed. So the lithium yeah. are sealed. But again, you want to make sure that the charge controller knows or is designed for that chemistry so it cannot overcharge the batteries right? Having a proper charge control will ensure that. The gel batteries in the bottom here, they don't have a cap that you can 
take off to refill them. But if you look closely, there is a plastic cap on the top. And if you were to take that off, don't ask me how I know, there's little rubber caps on each of the cells. So they do have a venting system. So if they are overcharged, mm -hmm. they will pop these little rubber caps off and they will vent. However, you cannot recover from that process. You will damage the battery. Depends on how much you overcharge it. Could be a significant damage to the battery if they're overcharged. Lithium, don't know. Like, don't ever hook up a lithium battery because of the fire hazard and the other hazards with them. You want to ensure that you have the proper charge controller for those batteries. So, yeah, Robin, I think uh, one of the points that Rob, uh, Rob made is very important is what kind of battery would you have inside your home in a living space? A wet cell, a wet lead acid is absolutely a no-no because of the hydrogen that's gassed off and the and a possible explosion hazard. Um, a LiPo or the, uh, the lithium iron phosphate are a good candidate for that. However, um, there's still a fire hazard. So those should be in some kind of a, a fireproof box or something like that. So definitely if you have them in a, well, even in any kind of an area, even your garage, you should give some thought to that. Yeah. And if you are looking at that, CEC, Canadian Electrical Code, will specify that any batteries inside of a dwelling unit cannot exceed 48 volts DC. So typically, we're going to take 12 volts, maybe two of them into a 24 volt system. But 48 volts is very common for telco communications. A lot of their communications uses 48 volts. But the Canadian Electrical Code specifies you cannot have beyond 48 volts unless you have it in an external portion to your building that is vented. So lots of hullabaloo with the Tesla power walls and some of the other technology that people are coming out with to have this backup battery system for my house. Well, wait a minute, you can't put that in the house because the voltage is too high. So there's a lot of other code concerns you have with those systems because you can't have that inside of a dwelling unit. So how do I take my Tesla power wall and mount it so it's exposed to the outside because then I have cold temperatures and lots of other concerns with that, right? So if that were a concern for anybody, that's basically where you want to talk to your safety codes officer, your inspector and say, hey, I'm looking at this technology. But for the rest of us, gel cells, no problem, right? Mm -hmm. Gel cells like that one in the bottom there, because they're a non-venting battery if they're charged under proper conditions. So a gel cell to a proper charge controller, you're not gonna have issues. If you have a UPS in your house, an uninterruptible power supply, it has a gel cell inside of it to be able to maintain that battery voltage yeah. to be able to supply the 120 volts when power fails. So, yeah. but the, the, the point is, yeah, for sure, make sure you have the correct charge controller for the technology of battery you have, absolutely. Yeah. Another question, Robin, on the, all of these batteries are two terminal batteries. Um, yep. And of course we know that lead acid um, and gel cells kind of take care of their individual cells, but the, uh, the lithium ion ones of course need equalization. So we presume that all these two terminal batteries like the Bianos and all that have um, battery management systems built into them. Um, I'm wondering if any of the more sophisticated solar systems uh, actually roll a BMS into the, uh, the chart controllers which kind of uh, in some ways would make sense to me but I don't know it's just a question. That's a really good question I never looked into that Peter I'm thinking most of the battery management systems are integral to the batteries themselves because of discharge concerns right so you want to ensure that that you know like your like my lithium ion batteries in my Milwaukee cordless tools they run 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 and then they stop right so the BMS the battery management system is saying hey can't discharge past that point. So it actually shuts down the battery itself. My only thought is by not having it in the battery, are you potentially exposing that system to other concerns unless you were purchasing a pre-made system that included charger and batteries so the manufacturer can be absolutely certain that you're using their charge controller with that battery system. So good question. Yeah. It would just it just seemed to make sense to me because the BMS is how the way they work is by discharging batteries. So that wastes energy. If you charge the cell only, how much is it needed individually? It would make one load load of more sense. But uh, I'm kind of dragging the topic off here. So <laughs> battery technology. If I had a million dollars, I'd be investing it in energy storage systems. This is the weak link to anything, like Jerry's point about what happens to this extra energy that I'm producing, I just don't use it. 
right? But imagine if you had an energy storage system that could utilize all of the energy being generated by the wind systems we have out there and the PV systems and the, the, the micro hydro systems. I think that the, the technology that we really need to focus on is not improving the efficiency of solar PV modules. It's improving the efficiency of these energy storage systems we have. I think that's, you know, extending the, the distance of your EV vehicles and so many other points would be possible if we had more advanced battery technology, right? So, so anyway, safety considerations, if you are playing with it as a hobbyist, be careful with those batteries. There's lead in there, they're heavy, right? So you wanna be careful about moving them around and whatnot. Don't forget the exposed terminals on top. So when we're talking about fusing components, as soon as you have that battery, the first thing you wanna do is take a fuse holder that's appropriate in size and opacity for the loads you're drawing off that battery. And you're gonna to wanna to mount that fuse as close as possible to the positive terminal of that battery, right? So that knowing that that 100 amp hour battery can deliver 100 amps over one hour or 20 amps over five hours. So it can run my transmitter for five hours, but if it's shorted out, it can deliver potentially low resistance connection, it can deliver thousands of amps over a few seconds, right? Damaging the battery and sparks and all sorts of other dangers. So be aware of that. When you're dealing with a battery, you've got this energy storage system. And you're gonna to want to ensure that you have a fuse holder as close as possible to the positive terminal so that if anything downstream, your radio, your charge controller, your anything shorts out for some reason, there is a fuse in there that is going to sacrifice itself instead of having some sort of danger. So the weight of the components, be careful with batteries. They are extremely heavy. Mounting of the PV modules, they are robust. They can handle a lot of stress, right? Don't walk on them on the roof. That little layer of dust that builds up over time is extremely slippery. Don't ask me how I know. So make sure that if you had to move around a PV system, that glass may look innocent, but is extremely slippery. So make sure you treat them with care. They'll last you a long time. Mount them so that they're not necessarily going to fall over your camping and they fall over and hit a rock or something. That one small point of impact can damage the glass uh, structure. But make sure you've got the proper fusing, whether it be some sort of power bar system that you have on there with the individual fuses for your components and whatnot. But make sure you're taking that into account for sure. All right, so again, at the very end, and like I say, I'll send this off to you, Pat. Uh, NABCEP is North American Energy something something. It's a great resource uh, uh, made by the Americans to be able to take a look at a lot of considerations for building PV systems. Renogy, uh, they've got some extremely good prices, but to your point, Dan, we're gonna have switching power supplies in here. We're gonna have electrical noise with the systems, but their prices are very reasonable for somebody wanting to get into the hobby, the PV hobby that is. Alternative energy tutorials are great introductory tutorials for folks wanting to look at learning more information on alternative energy systems. However, for those of you who want to deep dive into PV systems, and so when we were talking about them, Jerry, just a little while ago, you want to talk about semiconductors and junctions. You want to talk about solving the quasi-neutral regions inside of your PV module. I have no idea what that is, but if I wanted to learn about it, that's where it is right there, right? So if you really want to get into the depth of how a PV module works, this is your place, right? If you're looking at the properties, the angle, azimuth, sun's position, so many different things, you can find it right here. So a great resource for the for the people that may want to look for more information on PV systems and efficiencies, like you're saying. I'm just going to have a couple more minutes. Just want to show you folks what I've done with my Raspberry Pis here. So this is my um, uh, voltage monitor. So I have a analog to digital converter on my Pi. I've got four systems in my garage right now. My solar batteries running 24 volts. So there's four six volt 100 amp hour batteries right there sitting at 26.86, so they're good. On the right hand side, take a look. Sun came up in Ericana about uh, just after eight, it dipped. So I'm saying about probably about 10 o'clock when the sun started hitting the panels, maximized out at about 29 volts right there for a while when the sun was shining. But really my, my solar window was 10 to about two. So really four hours in that particular one, 
the other PV modules for my garage batteries are on top of the shed of my um, uh, the roof of my shed and they don't have as much sunlight so you can see a much smaller window covering those. This spike right here, if anybody's wondering what the heck happened there, Robin, this late at night, notice this line drop below the 24 volt mark. So when it drops below 24 volts, that's when my Raspberry Pi sensed that the battery voltage was below 24 volts and turned on my 120 volt battery charger. So my battery charger got turned on, whoop, brought it up to 27 volts, and now it's sort of sitting at the equalization or trickle charge, I should say, for the battery. So that spike right there was my battery charger coming on because I didn't have enough solar energy to keep it going. I was going to ask about that. Uh, so this is, I guess, this is a uh, feature that you know, would monitor, you know, if there's not enough solar energy, right, and switch it to the alternative source, right? Does all of them allow that or special models? Or no, this is, again, my hobby playing with these small computers. Basically, I just have a, a computer, the Raspberry Pi. Its job is simply to watch the voltage on these systems. And if they go outside of spec, not mm. over voltage, because the charge controllers handle the over voltage situation. But if they go under voltage, in this case, I've got it hooked up to a 120 volt battery charger, and it simply turns the 120 volt supply onto the battery charger to recoup them. So in the wintertime, <clears throat> yes, you see it. In the summertime, you don't. So that, again, we could have another conversation this node red software this software that you see right here looks extremely complex but i could show folks how to set this up in a raspberry pi probably within about a three hour window you could have these graphs it's it's incredibly easy and if anybody's played with node red <laughs> you know the graphs are okay i'm just i'm puzzled about uh, the switching is it like they're using some sort of relays there or how, how do you control them yeah. Yeah, um okay. i don't well, here i'll show you what is the safest for a non-electrical person to use? So Pi Shop. This power bar has a small little green jack on the side that'll take a 3.3 volt input or five volt input from these little computers, and it'll turn on safely a 120 volt load. So these are the devices I recommend to folks that are not comfortable working with 120. You can have these small devices, these Raspberry Pis or whatever, control this power bar and switch loads on and off safely. So these devices are the best way to go. If you're not comfortable working with relays and 120 volts and that sort of thing, not sure about it, I tell my students, if you're not sure about your electricians in fourth year, you better be, but if you're not, this is the device to get right here. So hold that thought though, because um, I just found some power bars at Home Depot for $25 that have six switched inputs by an ESP 8266 processor that I'm going to be playing with. So there might be some other alternatives for designing power bars that can switch that might be a bit more economical. But this is the safest one to go with right now, a power bar that you can switch from some small computer. Computer monitors the voltage, voltage drops too low, turn this little green lead supply 3.3 to 5 volts right there, and that will turn your 120 volt up to 15 amp load on so your battery charger no problem that can that can handle it right there so that's the safest way to do it okay thanks if, if you're not comfortable yeah using that so this is the first one i just want to show a couple more real quick um so robin do you just use voltage dividers to get your voltages down into the range of readable by your pi uh no i no because pies don't have an analog input they only have digital so I use the MC3008 analog to digital converter and take that and change it into the signals. What you can do though, is you can go with an ADS1115, which huh. is the Adafruit. I got a handful of those just arrived. Yep, exactly, right? So that'll do the same job that uses the I squared C or I2C bus. And again, it sounds the Greek that we've been talking about folks, but it's not, difficult. This IoT stuff these days, there are hundreds of websites to walk you through hooking these devices up. What I do for my students and for others is I show you actually how to do it. The, the website will tell you the code to do and how to do it, but people are still uncomfortable sometimes actually connecting the wires together. So that's where I find the education piece that Google and YouTube and everybody else offers. They offer you great talking advice but they don't offer you great hands-on advice and i think that's somewhere where maybe sas star jerry we can talk about having some opportunities to do some more hands-on learning for folks that are not uh, 
necessarily comfortable with it. So yeah, so that's what we do. The analog to digital, taking the analog voltage, it's 12 volts, but I've only got a, that ADS can handle it. So voltage divider down into the ADS, digital into the Pi. And then I typically run Python, but again, Node-RED will do the same job for you. My block heaters for my two vehicles out front right now are connected to this device right here. So when I go to Node-RED and I click on that little button, I just turned on the block heater to my wife's car and I've just turned on the block heater to my car. But I have it as set with temperatures, there's a monitor there. So when it drops below 18 degrees Celsius, my battery charger, and my block heaters come on from two o'clock in the morning to six o'clock in the morning. So I can do it manually or I can do it automatically as the temperature drops below. So outside, inside, that's just me testing inside the enclosure when we're talking about heat being generated by electronics or by battery systems. Right now outside, in, outside of my house is minus 13.5. Inside that enclosure, just from the Raspberry Pi and the power supply that's inside there, I have a five degree temperature difference just by the heat being generated by my electronics. So something I've always been wondering, how much heat is being generated by the devices we play with? The last one I wanna talk about here real quick. So those two PV modules you saw in my backyard, that's this graph on the left-hand side. So you can see that at eight o'clock last night, I was sitting at about 12.6, 12.7 volts, slowly dropped down, minimum at about nine or 10 or nine o'clock, 9.13 in the morning, 12.6. Notice how the peaks are flattened though. That's my charge controller saying, hey, you're up to that 14.4 volts. So even though the sunlight would have allowed a higher voltage, that flat top to those two peaks is because the charge controller is saying, nope, we're going to stop at 14.4 volts so we don't overcharge the batteries. That dip you see there, probably cloud cover that came by and dropped the voltage down being produced by my PV system. Then the clouds left, the voltage went back up again, and now it's dropped down to 12.8, whatever it happens to be, and it'll drop down. So we're going back to your point there, that battery is sitting in the snow outside. So it's sitting at about minus 13, but it has the ampacity to be able to continue to power the Raspberry Pi Pico that I have in there, but of course, very low power device, but still has the power to charge the battery throughout the day to give it enough charge to be able to last throughout the night. So Check back with me in seven days, the shortest day of the year. I'm curious to see if this thing goes into low voltage cutoff or if it's gonna be able to survive. So this is the type of graphing I do because I'd like to be able to see when I do an experiment, how successful is it? So the right-hand one, for those of you who know with the RSSI, I'm checking around with an 8266. I move it around my house and I actually have it transmit through MQQT. The signal strength of the wireless signal I have around the house. So I'm saying, hey, I wanna put a new toy out in the garage by the shed here. Can I reach my, my wireless in my house? Uh, Neg 71, we're hitting close to the noise floor there, but yeah, I can probably get away with it, right? So, so folks, yeah, you can tell I've got um, my remote control for my garage furnace. I've got my temperature set to 20 degrees. Right now, my temperature is 20.8. If I want to get it warmer in there, I simply move the slider up to 22 and now my garage is going to warm up or drop it down to 18 or whatever. So there's more than just the Raspberry Pi. I also have a couple regular thermostats in there to ensure that if the Pi locks up, it doesn't overheat my garage. And if the Pi dies, it doesn't let the garage go to freezing. So I also have some backup devices in parallel, but that's pretty much it. But yeah, the temperatures, uh, another interesting graph, just real quick and I'll be done here, Jerry. Um, I've always wondered with the sunlight hitting in my attic, is there enough heat being generated in my attic where I can take that heat even in the winter time and pump it into the garage to be able to harvest that heat from the attic? Well, in the hottest of times, if you look, right, that attic temperature is still staying quite cold. It does get above zero when the sun is hitting in the roof of my garage, but probably enough that, that I can't really harvest it in the middle of winter. The reason I monitor the ceiling temperature, if you look at this bottom graph here, every one of those bumps is when the furnace comes on, the heat in the ceiling rises. When the furnace goes off, the heat in the ceiling drops down. So by measuring those numbers of bumps, I can see how often my furnace is cycling in my garage. Um, so yeah, it's just sort of something I'm playing with just to see how many times does that furnace actually come on and off throughout a course of a 24-hour period. So lots 
of different testing you can do, folks. This IoT stuff is amazing with the prices and the power that it can actually control for so many different things. So. Yes, lots of things. And also in my house, this is my house control. I have LED lighting and the toe kicks of my bathrooms and bedrooms and that sort of thing. So if I want to turn the lights on in the toe kick of my master bathroom and my great grandkids come over for spending the night, I can simply just do that. Raspberry Pi turns on a FET. The FET turns on the 12 volt DC to the uh, LED light strips. So furnace fan, summertime, I have outside lights I have as well. But all this technology is so darn easy for non-programming folk to learn to be able to use it. So this is the programming side where sometimes we have challenges though is how do I wire up all these components to make these circuits functional and, and uh, workable. But these days, even that is becoming much, much easier to work with. Well, Jerry, that is it. That Thank I you so much, Robin. That's a great presentation. A lot of uh, things to think about. Um, I guess one of my questions uh, as I've been watching this is uh, so much is dependent on what you're using the batteries to power, uh, what kind of loads. And so designing a system or uh, just deciding on, on what you need really uh, is an impossible task for, for a general purpose system. You really need to tailor this to to like your system, I see you're, you're using very low power devices to control more high power devices. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. You may want to be uh, using this for field day where you, you just want to be drawing lots of uh, current for powering a rig or something like that. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of parameters, I, I would say you have to consider which depend on your specific situation, what it is you want to do. If you're powering a cabin or you're powering a rig or charging the batteries in a, in a car or wherever. And the nice the thing is thing you need to, to do is, you know, basically, you know, think of an equation where you've got your generation on one side and your consumption on the other. And you need to know what all of the parameters are on both sides. So for example, if you're going to be powering a radio, Right. You know, you say, yeah, I just want to, you know, do a pot activation. I'm going to drag a battery pack and, and my radio out to the park. Right. Well, OK, how long are you going to operate? How much time are you going to spend transmitting versus receiving? What is the energy consumption? How much current does your radio draw on receive? Right. And it'll vary if the volume is down or if you know, you're standing back and you got the volume cranked up, you know, it could be 300 milliamps, it could be an amp, right? So you have to do, it's it's basic, simple arithmetic at the end of the day, right? And then how much of the time are you going to be transmitting? So if it's a 40% transmit cycle, okay, how much does your transmitter draw on transmit? You know, if you're doing FT8, that's a 100% duty cycle. So you're going to be really you know, sucking out uh, of the battery. I realize what you're saying, Dan. You, you've got to look at the, the full, you know. The whole big output. picture. And then then you work on the other side of the equation and say, okay, I'm going to draw this many amp hours for my consumption activity. Now I need to put this much into it. Right. And, and, and that's what varies for every use case, right? So, you know, if you're going to do POTA and do CW, you're going to have a different consumption pattern than if I operate beside you at the same time, you know, for the same duration, but I'm doing FT8. But the nice thing is with a lot of this technology, going back to your point, Jerry, is if you're in field day and you have your vehicle with you, um, Dana, you've got that battery sitting in the back. Do you normally last the day with a, with our car rally with that one battery, or do you normally have to start the vehicle to recharge it? It lasts the day. Um, I do need a boost converter in line if I want to use it because um, my power leads are too long and too small gauge. So I low voltage the uh, the radios. But uh, but yeah, that 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 lasts because the duty cycle is not that heavy. Yeah, and so that's the thing. Like you say, Dan, it absolutely 
it does matter. But if you have another power supply, like your vehicle beside you, or you've got a Jenny, and again, not for soda poda applications, but if you have another power supply, you can still set up a solar PV system. And if the solar cannot keep the charge up in the battery, it's not like, oh, I've just wasted this money. No, you've got you learned that, but also you have a secondary power source like Jenny or, or vehicle or whatever the case may be that you can then use to recharge those batteries and, and be able to last. So if it is a regular usage, hopefully your PV system is going to do fine. But it, what if it's all cloudy and rainy that day? Well, solar will still help, not as much, of course, then you're still going to be using your vehicle. So you're absolutely right. It does vary, but Solar is not necessarily just a standalone system. It can be for emergency um, uh, activations, but more so it's about, in my opinion, or my attitude is to play with the technology to have a better understanding of it and have it supplement my regular usage. So I'm not having to pay to keep my batteries charged up every day. My solar panels do it most of the time and then 120 volts steps in when it has to just to keep them topped up. So more about playing with it. And like you say, Jerry, yeah, it's it's hard to say, but to Dan's point, how many, you know, out of that eight hour day, how much time do I expect to be transmitting? And I'm just going to say at 20 amps for that period of time, how many amps over how many hours am I consuming? Make sure your battery has that capacity. Get the solar panel that's big enough to fit in your car <laughs> when you're taking it with you or whatever the case may be. And know that that's going to be potentially good enough. And if not, then again, depending upon how serious you are, you may look at purchasing a second PV module that you can then tie in series with the first to be able to feed that into the MPPD controller. Because again, parallel, problem with the parallel connection is if I have a big PV module that's putting out 36 volts and I try to parallel that with a small PV module that's putting out 12 volts, that 36 volt module in parallel is gonna try to backfeed that extra voltage into the 12 volt module and shut it down because it's got backfeed diodes built in. So you wanna make sure that you have identical components if you parallel. If you tie them in series, <coughs> 36 plus 12 is 48. That MPPT charge controller can handle the 48 volts of those two tied in series and the current that they have and still be able to deliver 14.4 at whatever ampacity. So lots of other considerations to have paralleling or series or how we set those things up. But um, yeah, certainly again, hard to say to be able to walk away and say, I know exactly what size I need for the application, but I think lots of hopefully information to help you play with the technology and see what you can do, whether it be for your RV or for your field day activities.